he's the man who reminds us that sports is the greatest reality TV show in the world on the daily. Jason Whitlock from The Blaze is here now. I'm James Polis. Welcome to Zero Hour. Jason Whitlock is the host of Fearless with Jason Whitlock right here at Blaze Media. He's got an event coming up, Fearless Army Roll Call 2.0. Check it out, fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Welcome, Jason. James, thanks for having me. How are you doing today, man? Doing awesome. I'm doing better than Scotty Scheffler. Uh, <laughs> yeah, man. So uh, Scotty Scheffler, uh, uh, biggest, uh, really biggest golf star in the world right now, I guess, and, and arrested, uh, non-compliant. The, the cops dragged him in. What's going on? Uh, I think it was a misunderstanding. They had an accident outside the golf course that backed up traffic. And then Scotty apparently didn't obey some commands from a police officer that he wasn't sure was a police officer. Then the police officer overreacted and Scotty ended up in handcuffs with the media filming it. Uh, and so it all just goes back uh, to my point that I always make. If you just comply, there's never a problem. Uh, so Scotty, Scotty Sheffer getting treated like uh, the rest of humanity t for a brief time this morning. Yeah, all right. You got to watch that lip. Well, let's uh, let's dig into it here. Uh, let's start out with Harrison Butker. I mean, this guy he gives one speech at one college, and suddenly he's even more of a star than he was uh, on the field. This was a real stem winder. Uh, Benedictine College Catholic School. He's a Catholic guy. Um, uh, really took uh, Biden to the woodshed, although not exactly by name. Uh, there's just so much here. Uh, what was your gut reaction seeing that speech uh, and, and just kind of bracing for impact when this thing went, went national? I think it speaks to uh, how uncommon common sense is and how much hostility there is for biblical truth. Uh, what uh, Harrison said if he had said it 30 years ago, no one would bat an eye and no one would really care. But in this new day and age where everything's taken out of context, you know, people are trying to say, like he said, that women should only be in the kitchen and they should only be homemakers. That's not what he said. Uh, you know, he just said that, you know, women or his wife. Uh, experienced the greatest fulfillment from being a wife and a mother and a homemaker. And he wished that uh, for some of those graduates or some of the young ladies graduating from uh, Benedictine. But uh, man, this turned into a major, major deal. He's misogynist, he's homophobic, he's transphobic. He's the worst human being on the planet, not named Donald Trump. Uh, and he's actually just a shy, introverted kicker uh, who's got some biblical beliefs and is, you know, trying to be an upstanding Catholic. Yeah, it's really out of control. Do you think the mob is going to take him down? No, uh, I, I don't. One, I've seen, uh, I think it's Gracie Hunt, maybe it's Clark Hunt's wife, the owner of the Chiefs. Uh, she made some comments to Fox News, kind of supporting him and supporting his beliefs. I've seen some of his teammates uh, Chris Jones, their best defensive player, rally around him. I, I, I think it's unlikely that uh, he gets taken down. And, and uh, you know, they got to be if, – if the NFL could tolerate Colin Kaepernick kneeling before every game on the field and they tolerated that for an entire season, uh, I think they should be able to tolerate a Catholic going to a Catholic college and – uh, preaching Catholic values. I just don't see how that's a fireable offense. Yeah, you know, really not that controversial to say that uh, husband and wife and holy matrimony, it's good for them to have children and love them and raise them. Uh, he didn't even say that women shouldn't vote. 
Yeah, something I've said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have. Uh, so, you know, I mean, this is obviously, uh, you, you've you uh, put yourself in the crosshairs on that one. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of people, it's funny, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people right now are really, uh, really uh, in a bad mood about democracy. Uh, it's been demagogued so much, and you got guys like Biden and, and his little crew out there talking about our sacred democracy while turning America into some kind of digital totalitarian hellscape. Uh, so a lot of folks, and I, you know, what I'm seeing is even younger, some younger women are like, you know what, I'm not interested, not going to do it. Uh, I, I think you've, you've never voted yourself. Uh, help people understand here. Uh, you, you don't want to vote. You don't think women should vote. Should nobody vote? What's going on? My, my point of view is a more sophisticated, nuanced point of view is that uh, basically uh, only families man, woman, child should vote. Uh, and that's, I'm not married. I don't think I should vote. Uh, I'm not as invested in the future as mom and dad are that are married and, and, and have a kid. And so, you know, if you go look at the history of voting, uh, much of it came, uh, American history came from when the family unit was intact you only needed one vote because the vote represented the family. And so that fell upon men uh, to vote and represent their family. And But now that we've, uh, we're becoming not a family culture, we're uh, a single parent culture or whatever, I, I think it, it leads to all the chaos. And so I want everything to lean towards the support of families and responsible people that are raising kids should have the right to vote, and they should have one vote within that family. And I don't care who cast it, man or woman, uh, but you know, those of us that are out here living in a single life or an irresponsible life, uh, shouldn't our vote just shouldn't matter as much as people that are married with kids and, and are sitting there thinking about, hey, what's best for my kids in the future? Uh, that's who I think should be voting. Well, you're a very brave man to try to uh, show some nuance on television. Not always the best format for a nuanced discussion, but you know, you don't think that we're actually going to repeal the 19th Amendment anytime soon. I mean, this is like, uh, you know, it's it's a take. I can sort of see, you know, where you're coming from, but uh, you, do do you really have any hope or uh, or any expectation that we're ever going to get to uh, uh, replace the 19th Amendment with the Jason Whitlock Amendment? <laughs> uh expectation no do i have hope yes always and i think as things get more and more chaotic as, as the more we go into this baby mama culture and this very individualistic society and every everything's based on how an individual feels eventually people are going to return to sanity and say you know what uh this biblical worldview these standards that were that were in place and, and normalized from years ago when, when the founding of this country and the founding documents were based on biblical principles, I do think we're going to be forced to return to that. And pro maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, if we ever want to get the world back on track, we're going to have to return to that. And I, that's what I think you're hearing from someone like Harrison Bucker and others that, uh, you know, you know what, the patriarchy actually works. And you got to remember, the Bible is a very patriarchal document. And male leadership does work. And people are going to start to realize that we've been convinced that we owe women a debt. And it's just not true. Yeah, I don't think anyone's uh, going to argue that we're uh, facing some kind of major reckoning coming up here. Uh, I, you know, might come tomorrow, might come 10 years from now. Uh, one way or the other, uh, we know that the system we got isn't working. Uh, that's why we're in the, this, this bizarre moment where we got the same two guys, uh, you know, pushing 100, running for president, uh, fighting over uh, what's, what's left of this kind of crumbling uh, regime that we got. Uh, but uh, gosh, you know, I, probably a lot of women might say, well, hey, if family's uh, the most important thing to have a vote, then let's, let's give uh, family two votes. And the, the husband and wife both, uh, you know, then you can really amp up the family that way. Uh, I don't want to get stuck on it, though. Uh, you know, this is, it's hard to peer into the future. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in the present these days. Got a lot of futurists running around telling us what's going to happen to us. And, I, you know, I, I want those guys to take a seat a lot of the time. Uh, just to go back to Butker real quick, though. 
Um, one of the things that I found most impressive about that speech, uh, some of the things that he said about the spiritual life, you know, uh, he's a Catholic, uh, but these are really, you know, these are things that are applicable, I think, to all Christians, uh, even to folks who, you know, wouldn't necessarily describe themselves as Christians, but are, but are searching, inquiring. Um, and basically what he said is, you know, it's, it's, it's important in your life, regardless of what you're doing, to be able to quiet the noise and recognize that it's not going to be your job that's going to save you. It's not going to be public perception that's going to save you. It's going to be just working day in and day out, you know, moment by moment sometimes even, to just get closer to God, just increase your proximity to God. And that if you have that spiritual discipline and you can sort of quiet your mind enough to establish those practices and recognize that, yeah, it's going to be a long journey, maybe a journey, you know, that, that never really ends getting all the way face to face to God. Uh, but, but having that kind of approach, having that kind of perspective, uh, it can really suck some of that, um, I mean, some, some would say, you know, demonic energy out of the, uh, the crazy surround of media that's always present, whether it's for, you know, superstar athletes or, or just folks on, uh, you know, on social media who, uh, who raise their hand and say something that, uh, that causes that mob to rise up and, and try to destroy them. Yeah, it rings true with me that what, what he was saying there just as someone who uh, prioritize the wrong things uh, in my 20s and 30s and even parts of uh, my 40s even. I I've been really, really heavy into my career, uh, proving a point as a journalist and as a sports journalist and executing my career was the primary focus of my life. And I made decisions that were best for my career uh, that weren't best for me personally. And, and, and I've been having to deal with that now that I'm in my, uh, now that I'm 57 years old and I look back and think about, uh, the decisions I made in dating, uh, women that I should have married, but I didn't think fit with my career. And, and I just, I'm t I prioritize building this great career and I, believe now, you know, and I've thought for several years, like it was a mistake. I overemphasized my career. And so those things that he's talking about as it relates to women, I think also relate to a lot of men uh, that, that our lives get out of balance. We start thinking about our bank account or some of us think about our celebrity and, and fame rather than what's really important and what you know, what God wants for us and prescribe for us and what's really authentically what's best for us. So, you know, I, I see women getting all upset about Harrison. Bowles. There's a lot of men that should be offended and reflecting about their own choices as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, personally, it's been wild seeing this kind of resurgence of sort of Christian guys in, in sports and people being willing to speak out. Uh, it's a real change of tone, you know, whatever you think about uh, a guy like Colin Kaepernick. I mean, just the whole vibe has really shifted, uh, kind of something that, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't cooked up in the lab. This wasn't some something kind of cl closet PR campaign that's been rolled out on people. Seems to be a, an organic situation. I mean, you look at a guy like Nikola Jokic, uh, Jokic he's, he's, I mean, he's kind of ahead of the curve on this. He just wants to go back to the for farm and raise his horses and hang out in his town. He's, he's uh, you know, get, getting photographed with his priest and uh, there's uh, social media, you know, you can find clips of guys who are sort of doing parodies of, uh, of Jokic, you know, not even been emotionally invested in the game, but still like destroying everyone. Um, you know, do you see this this guy Jokic as someone who's going to be around for a long time, kind of continuing to show people that there is just like a fundamentally spiritually different way of looking at sports, professional sports. Uh, you know, maybe not as something where you're phoning in like an all-star performance, but where you know the, it's it's not the it's not an idol. It's not something that that is going to consume you and cause you to worship it. Uh, instead of maintaining you know a really rooted grasp of sort of what life's all about, whether it's uh, your hometown or or your family or or your faith. Yeah, I think Nicola represents a man who has his life more in balance than a lot of athletes uh, and properly balanced uh, th than a lot of athletes. I, I, I think that he does love the game. He takes it seriously, but he doesn't allow it to consume him. And he's re really into his family, his brothers. Uh, he's into his home country. I believe he's from, is, is he from Serbia? Serbia, yeah. Serbia. Or is it, yeah uh, Luka, uh, Luka Donkers, I can't remember. But 
uh, he just seems to have things in, in balance, and that shows up on the court. It's why he's not the most talented guy uh, in the NBA, but he's the most efficient, and he knows he's figured out how to excel at this sport despite whatever his physical limitations are. Uh, you know, I think he's a great example uh, of, of, you know, putting your life and career in, in balance and in harmony. And, and I, I, I think a lot of athletes uh, would love to be able to tap into that. But, you know, many of them are obsessed with social media. Nikola Jokic isn't someone I've ever seen on Twitter. Maybe he is. Uh, but, you know, I just don't see him on these social media apps. He doesn't seem to care. Whereas everybody else has this false belief that we can have it all, that we can do it all. And we can be all things to all people, and we can and 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 we can satisfy all people. And that's what I like about Harrison Buck, Bucker. He's like, nah, I'm not gonna try to be the most popular guy. I'm gonna stand on some truth that I believe in. And I look at Jokic is like, I, I don't really don't care about fame. There was another guy in the NBA that Jokic reminds me of. It's Tim Duncan. Uh, Tim Duncan was the ex exact same way in many regards wasn't into social media, wasn't into building some huge brand that he could be a pitchman for every product out there, just wanted to play ball, made enough money, a lot of money playing ball, that he didn't have to chase every bag. And that that's the other thing I think we're seeing with Nikola Jokic is he's not trying to be everything. And, and that's my fear for uh, someone like Caitlin Clark because uh, – I, I think her handlers and, you know, getting in bed with Nike right away or whatever, they're going to try to make her bigger than life. And that may not be what's best for her. That may be too much that they put on her plate and it could end up crushing her. Yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, I mean, she's she's quite young, whether it's uh, whether it's her or some of these other sort of younger women. I mean, the, the incentives, the pressure, you just see that machine, that corporate machine is just so hungry to turn them into that kind of packaged product and, and uh, you get, get it all vertically integrated. Uh, what, what would you counsel someone who finds themselves in that position? You know, how, how do you tell someone that they're better off saying no to like, you know, the, the 360 deal with Nike? Uh, you know, with someone like Caitlin Clark, who I think is a Catholic, her parents, are together and they're both all involved in her life, you know, I would just try to engage her in conversations about what's really going to make her happy. She's got this boyfriend who I believe has a job with the Indiana Pacers. And so they're both in Indianapolis and, and she needs to really ask herself. One of the things I, I, I legitimately thought she should do was come back for a fifth year in Iowa. She was going to make a bunch of money, name, image, in likeness. She could have played a fifth year of college basketball because of COVID. She could have made $10, $15 million. And then I would have stepped away from basketball. And, you know, if I was her, I would have advised her, go marry that boyfriend of yours. You just made $15 million. You'll never have to really work again. You'll be an ambassador for the University of Iowa. You can go out and give speeches for the rest of your life. Uh, trying to be uh, the person that lifts the WNBA into relevance. Woo, that's a monument. <clears throat> that's a monumental task, man. And uh, I, I it, it's nearly impossible to do. In my view, I, that league is so hyper masculine and so hyper LGBTQ. I just don't know if it's ever going to reach a mass audience. And they're putting all that burden on her, and and she needs to ask her: Is that really the burden she wants to carry? Uh, as you know, James, I can see you got a wedding band on. The burden of executing a successful marriage is a lot. That's a heavy burden. And then she probably wants to have kids. Uh, like That's a lot. And and so, you know, for someone like Caitlin Carr, I would have been trying to get stay another year at Iowa, stay wrapped in that bubble of love that they have for you in Iowa. You're just not strong enough. Uh, to fix all the problems that the WNBA has. But, you know, trust me, Nike and the corporate pressures and all the dollars that are 
being offered her in there. They're all telling her, this is important for young girls. If you're this huge basketball star, young girls all over the world are going to be inspired. And the next Hillary Clinton will be elected president at 102 years old because of your basketball career. And she's probably bought it and <laughs> is going to try to do all that and probably going to blow up in her face and the WNBA. Yeah, it is sort of crazy where the, the sales pitch is, you know, well, you, you got to worship the machine or else uh, the world isn't going to worship you back. Uh, that, you know, that to me always sounds like a bit of a devil's bargain. Uh, I, I appreciate your sharp eye. This is my right hand, so nothing on the left yet. Uh, wedding's coming in uh, oh. this, this summer, though, so right, right around the bend. Uh, always, always appreciate the wise counsel. I mean, you look at women in sports, and I think, you know, your, your characterization of WNBA, I mean, this is a, kind of one of the, the pointy tips of the spear of what they're trying to do, that kind of corporate regime about sports and really woke it up and really make it a place where, you know, if you're just kind of a normal red-blooded American woman, you might look around and find yourself wondering if you are allowed to belong. Uh, and then you look at college sports. You look at what the Biden administration is doing with, uh, you know, trying to integrate uh, uh, individuals who are, are not women, although they may uh, present themselves that way, into women's sports. Uh, is it becoming impossible to be a female athlete in America? Yeah, and I'll go beyond athletics. What What is happening here is that women feminists have talked women into competing with men in every endeavor in in the workplace in sports uh hell, in the bedroom uh or or in just in every way possible they're convincing women they should be competing with men not complimenting them not being a help me for men and they're looking at all the progress that we've made in the past and said, you know what? If women were competing with men for 2,000 years, things would have been so much better. And, and so, you know, we always think the grass is greener uh, someplace else. And it, it's, it's just foolish. It's, it's, and it leads to the kind of destruction. But, yeah, in college sports, uh, Biden and just the whole Title IX feminist movement, it's all about uh, men and women competing against each other. They want, they, they want to see it in sports because they want to they back up everything they're doing outside of sports. They use sports as a way to normalize it. It's, it's very appropriate for uh, men and women to be competing against each other. Uh, Bill Thomas, we're going to call you Leah Thomas, and now you can go out here and swim against women, and you can go be naked with women in the locker room and, and all that. And, and people just got to see the bigger picture. It sounds like it's just sports, but it's, it's really about a global initiative of pitting men and women against each other rather than men and women seeing each other as complements of each other. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, the killer is just watching the, that rhetoric over really the past 25 years or even more where it's like, uh, you know, we got to we got to flood the zone with get, get all those women into the workforce, you know, give them the opportunity to make their own money. You know, it sounds great. Uh, and, and you watch generations of, of girls do this, go to go to the college, do the thing, uh, get the career track, work their way up the ranks, head head toward upper management. Uh, and for some, you know, it's a happy story, but for a lot of them. Uh, they're just sitting there in the cubicle working a job that's even more soul destroying than than the crappy job that their fathers had. And you look at that thing and you go, you know, where's the where's the progress? You know, I don't I don't see it. Uh, and I do think, you know, just kind of monitoring social media, there are uh, voices coming out of younger generations of women, um, whether they got a smile on their face and they say, you know, uh, I, I did it, I tried it, it, it sucked, I bailed. Or whether they're just in tears, saying like, you know, this is this is destroying my life. There's no there's no exit. Uh, I can't even afford groceries. You know, maybe I get to say hi to my cat in the morning and good night to my cat at night, and that's about it. And you know, yeah, from one perspective, like welcome to Earth. Like life is tough. You know, if you, you got to expect to suffer your way through if you want to get anywhere, and if you try to escape suffering, that's just going to create its own kind of suffering. But gosh, I mean, I don't think you know. Look, they did this to men. They did this to men first. 
They convince the men to, oh, you gotta leave your house, you gotta go, go get the best job that you can get, get in your car, drive two hours to work, work eight hours, turn around, drive home. By the time you get home, you know, like you're, you got a TV dinner waiting for you, your kids are already in bed. They already did it to the guy, and this isn't me, you know, you can, this is Christopher Lash, this is a lot of people over, this goes all the way back to the 70s, and they say like, look, you know, it used to be the family was at home for together most of the time. And they, they, they pried the men out of the households. They sent, sent them off there. You know, you can think about a show like Mad Men or something where you, you get all these guys together in a skyscraper floating in, in the, 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 the top of Manhattan. And what, what do you do? Well, you, you, you cheat on your wives. You, you get hammered at lunch. Uh, you uh, spend all your time in this really cerebral mode trying to make a bunch of money. It's spiritually destructive. And, uh, and now they, they're running the same game plan with the women, and surprise, surprise, you, you know, you get similar or, or even worse results. Uh, yeah, women are, you know, oftentimes more sensitive and more emotional than men. That's not a bad thing, but putting them through the ringer like this, the way that they're done with men, it really hurts them even more. Uh, so, you know, this, I mean, the, 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 the democracy thing, you know, this is still a free country. We love our, our constitutionally guaranteed form of government. These things are really important, but they are not working as intended. Uh, they are not working as designed. Uh, something else has been built on top of that, and we're really starting to see people suffer. We're starting to see them pay the price. Uh, I I, uh, I could go on, but uh, what I really what I really want to do is uh, we got to talk about Tom Brady. You know uh, the the roast. Some people like the roasts. Some people think the roasts are kind of kind of disgusting and, and pointless. Um, but whatever it is, it's definitely a circus. Tom Brady decided to step in. Now he's having regrets. Uh, what do you make of it? Uh, do you think uh, Brady is entering into some sort of weird, uh, potentially washed era here? Um, and, uh, and do you think that, uh, that, that, that the roast is going to suffer as an institution? No, listen, I, I think Tom Brady uh, realized what we all should have realized in real time. The roast was great. It was hilarious. And for those of us that enjoy comedy, we love to see them push the envelope and say nothing's off limits. But for Tom Brady to sit on a stage and laugh on camera as people came up and just annihilated Giselle Bungeon, called her all kinds of whores and just shred her. I don't have a problem with any of those jokes. I have a problem with Tom Brady sitting there laughing when Giselle Bungeon, no matter what she did to him, and uh, obviously or evidently she cheated on him uh, with her jiu-jitsu trainer, and you know maybe she, some people think she's a witch. Maybe that's all true. But for Tom Brady, forever, for the rest of his life, Giselle Bungeon is only his, the, ch uh, the mother of his children, yeah. and he needs to respect that. And so by him sitting there laughing and co-signing and participating in all this, he's harming his children. And I think he realized that, that his children have felt the impact of that. And other kids watch the roast and are probably mocking his children uh, about all the jokes that were cracked on, on his mother. And so Tom Brady needs to realize the same way he jumped up and said, hey, man, Bob Kraft is off limits, don't crack those jokes, he should have jumped up and said, the mother of my children, that's off limits uh, for this roast. And so if he can jump up and protect a, a 80 year old billionaire, he should have jumped up and protected the mother of his kids because that is who she is. She, she's not his ex-wife, she's the mother of his kids and he should have protected her for the sake of their kids. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that. I mean, you know, this is a guy who really did kind of submit himself to to the machine, uh, took the ride, uh, you know, bought bought the ticket. A uh, lot of success to show for it. Really, an icon in a lot of people's minds. Uh, you know, regardless of what you think about the Patriots organization. Uh, do you think he has regrets? I mean, you know, the, the marriage is toast, uh, the, the roast. You know, I mean, it, it almost looked like he was watching his life flash before his eyes some, for some of it. I don't think he has uh, regrets. I mean, he has obvious regrets about the impact on his kids. I, I don't know if he fully regrets doing the roast, collecting the check, uh, and, and I don't know if he fully yet regrets the animus that he has 
towards the mother of his kids. That's a very difficult thing uh, to get beyond. If she cheated on him uh, with her jujitsu trainer, as everyone alleges, that's very difficult to get beyond. Most men, most women can't get over uh, infidelity. But when you have kids, you have to. You, you know, I, I've had this, my parents divorced when I was five years old. And so I, I know my father was unfaithful. And, and uh, I know the kind of pain, the lifelong kind of pain and scars that can cause on a woman. I saw it in my mother. Love my dad. Uh, he's now passed. Uh, and get it. Th- those are, but, but I witnessed firsthand the kind of scars that can leave. And, and, and I saw my parents in divorce bicker over things like child support and other things. And, and they were unable, particularly my father, unable uh, to just move beyond whatever their bad feelings were towards each other and just treat each other like, you know what? That's the mother of my kids. That's the father of my kids. Uh, I got to get over my hurt feelings. And again, my parents actually did uh, a very good job with me and my brother, but Again, they made some mistakes, and so I'm, I'm very. I've always been cognizant of the fact that, you know, friends of mine that go through divorce, if they ever bring the questions to me, I, I'm always like, "Hey, man, leave that woman standing up, very tall. Don't don't regret the money you have to send her, but you're better off supporting her and keeping her on her feet and wishing her well. That's going to serve the best interests of your kids over the long haul." Because if you don't, if you run the risk and try to bring her down and try to harm her, uh, probably elevates the chances of your child having drug problems, drinking problems, ending up in jail, a bunch of other collateral damage and heartaches. Uh, that it just whatever revenge you're trying to exact on that woman just isn't worth it. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, Got to say though, you know, we're we're getting we've we've had for a while a kind of glimpse at that seedy underbelly, that sort of dark underbelly of of uh, of the world of uh, of modeling, whether it's Naomi Campbell sort of being in the in the Epstein expanded universe or some of the other stuff uh, haunting Victoria's Secret, Les Wexner, you know that whole world. Uh, do you think uh, there's anything to this witchcraft stuff? I mean, you know, wit- witchiness is uh, is definitely trending. Uh, in 2024, uh, whether you know you see it in like your goth barista or you know at a at a higher level, um, it seems like it's just going to continue as a force. And uh, in in times of spiritual warfare, you can't be surprised that kind of thing happens. Uh, what's your read? Yeah, I I don't want to talk about anybody specifically, but do I think some of these Hollywood starlets and models practice witchcraft? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I believe much of Hollywood is run by a satanic cult and, you know, ritualized sexual practices and perverted sexual practices are is the price of admission. And so we all sit around and say, oh, man, these guys, these athletes, they get to marry supermodels and they get to marry Holly. They get to date Hollywood starlets. And and, you know, having lived out in L.A. for 10 years, and I can remember when I first got out there, my thoughts were, oh, man. The women in California and Hollywood, they're so much better than women in Kansas City or women in Indianapolis, two places where I grew up and or live. And you get out there and you find out, like, no, nah, man, they're, not, they're no better. And they, they cake on so much makeup on TV. When you see them out somewhere without all that makeup, they really don't look that good. Uh, and they fart no different than anybody else. And they probably got a bunch of other problems, drug problems, and, and just issues with attention, wanting attention that you just quickly figure out, like, nope, uh, the girls back in the Midwest or in the middle of the country uh, are, are just as hot, and they're definitely a lot smarter and more grounded. Yeah, man. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in LA myself, uh, still do. And uh, as, as far as I can see things, um, you know, that, that energy... It was, I don't know how many election cycles it was back when uh, there was a, there was a, a, a woman running for uh, Congress, I think, and uh, she was accused of, uh, of, of being a practicing witch or of, uh, of dabbling in that world. Uh, and she had to get on, get on TV and do like a political ad, I'm not a witch, I'm you, you know, like really like denying the allegations and like trying to, trying to seem wholesome. Um, you know, I, I can't, couldn't, couldn't possibly tell you what was really going on under the hood there. 
uh, but we've come so far. You know, now it's it's really not an argument about whether or not witchcraft is a thing. It's an argument about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And just to see the culture like move to that stage, definitely not an encouraging sign. Uh, but in another sense, you know, okay, let's have it out. You know, the truth's out. Uh, these kinds of uh, of occult practices, you know, always been been in the mix, lurking under the surface, and especially with like celebrity, sports, the money, the power. Uh, you know, in a in a world where Bruno Mars is, I think, what fifty million dollars in the hawk to MGM, like there are ways, dude. There are ways of getting these people who seem to have it all just like wrapped around the little finger of uh, of various folks who who don't appear in the press and and who like to keep it that way. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty discouraging in one sense, but in another sense, you know, uh, the the truth will out, and uh, and that that kind of feels like a part of this to me. Listen, uh, you know, Cat Williams in his interview with Shannon Sharp kind of <laughs> set the stage for where we're at. This yeah. is the year of truth, the year of people taking the scales off their eyes and recognizing. Let's go back to the Tom Brady roast. They edited it out of Netflix, but Kim Kardashian took that stage and got booed viciously, viciously. And and I think that that's like a critical key moment where people are like, oh, wow, the public is starting to turn on these celebrities. And I, James, I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, there's this TikTok digital guillotine thing. Have you heard about wow. this? Wow. No, uh, no. News to me. Yeah. Leftists upset with their celebrities for not being more outspoken in support of Palestine. Okay. And they've started blocking and or unfollowing a lot of celebrities because you're not left wing enough. I thought you were really down for this. You know, who are your puppet masters at these uh, agencies and in Hollywood that are telling you you can't be pro-Palestine? And so they they call it the digital guillotine where they're blocking these celebrities. And so there's we're in a time that's scary and chaotic. And, and so, you know, <laughs> I'll go back to, did you watch the HBO show Game of Thrones. Oh yeah. Uh, where, yeah. Littlefinger says uh, chaos is the ladder. Yeah. And and that's yeah. what I think we're seeing with some tying everything we've been talking about from Harrison Buck Bucker to everybody. Like it's a good time to be a Christian. You can climb that ladder up. This chaos gives you an opportunity to state your values publicly. And have people have to really pay attention to it and react to it uh, because we're, we're in that time where the truth is so provocative and so uh, reviled that the truth is actually even more valuable than at any time in my lifetime. Yeah, I like that. Uh, I, I want to throw one more thing at you. We're talking about you know celebrities and how they're, they're kind of... Uh, they got this whole machine behind them designed to make them almost seem like superhuman beings, you know, just at like a, a Mount Olympus level, uh, whether they're in, they're in sports or entertainment or whatever. Uh, we, we've now got word that there's, uh, there's going to be an enhanced Olympics where you can, uh, you can take the drugs, you can take the stimmies, uh, just really, you know, see what, uh, what someone who's taking full advantage of all the kind of biotech and, and biohacking uh, see what they can do out there uh, on the field. Um, looks like this thing's actually going to happen. I don't know. I don't know how soon, but they got the money behind it, and they got they got an organizer and everything. How do you feel about that? Uh, do you think that uh, that it's just kind of inevitable that technology is going to just continue to to make itself felt more and more in sports, whether it's through uh, sort of uh, like uh, like trans or or uh, you know really people who are really biohacked and and jacked up on different kinds of uh, of modifiers, genetic modifiers. Sounds like Westerworld, or I don't, is that the show that I think was on HBO? With, yeah, Westworld. You know, you're, you're yeah, half human, half uh, whatever. Uh, I don't know if I'll be watching. When you first said it, it the enhanced Olympics, I, and I'm I'm not joking here, but somewhat I am joking. I was like, so what? They're going to be uh, female sprinters with BBLs. And and fake breast is that what we're talking about? Uh, Different timeline. I think I may have more interest in that than the steroid up enhanced Olympics. But uh, yeah, I don't think I'll be watching it. But it, it 
someone will watch it and and maybe it'll be interesting but I, I'm not even is it going to be any the, the Olympics have always been enhanced and and as long as there's been money to be made in sports athletes have been cutting corners with stimulants and drugs or whatever to try to get ahead uh, so you know I'm not surprised we've gotten here they're just we're in this year of truth and era of truth where people are being transparent that they're, you know, I don't want to go too far with it, but it's just like, didn't King Charles just come out with the painting of himself? Oh yeah. Where it's filled with all that Baphomet stuff. And, and it's like, we're in this era where like people are saying, you know what? I'm a witch. I'm a devil worshiper. I'm this, I'm that. I'm just going to let it all hang out there. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're at that time where people are, are living out their truth and, and you know, it, it, it's a good time. I actually am somewhat enjoying it because, uh, you know, let's, let's remove the mystery from all of this and, and let people say who they're really representing because I believe, James, we're in a battle of good versus evil, and, and I'm very happy that the evil side is raising their hand and saying, yep, this is who I am. Deal with it. Yeah, I think there's a lot to it. I mean, this uh, definitely seems like a time of increasing revelation as technology just, you know, it really throws down the gauntlet. It makes people go like, okay, you know, why not replace yourself with a computer? Why not stay in bed all day? Why not, uh, you know, stop, stop dating, stop having kids, stop working a job. Uh, in, in the future, you'll own nothing and be happy. Like, we see, we see the memes, we see the propaganda. A uh, lot of, you know, it's, it's, it's undercover of celebrating whoever you are. You know, we love you, whoever you are. We might have uh, taken your jobs away and, and you know, made, made life unaffordable. And you, you live in a, a tiny, uh, you know, pod somewhere in a, in a city that looks like all the other cities. But however you want to identify, we'll, we'll love you. Well, that's, that's proven to be a, a pretty bad bargain already. Uh, you know, we've already seen kind of this, this arc over the past four years where uh, all that kind of energy, even just around something like, you know, a, a pride march or whatever, uh, as, as they like to call it, uh, used to feel like a lot more, uh, I don't know, naive or something. And, and you fast forward to today and, you know, you're just seeing those crazy forces. I mean, you, you see them uh, being, uh, being just, just more shameless and more overt. Uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the viewer will be left uh, by by you and me to go check out on the internet the the uh, the painter for that that uh, King Charles painting you know this guy uh, this guy's been around uh, he's got some very interesting friends and associates uh, and it's it's increasingly coming to light you know so uh, I I agree with you I think uh, the uh, the the battle lines are being drawn and um, it's not going to be you know uh, like Lord of the Rings where uh, both sides get their armies together and put their Put their helmets on and grab their swords and meet on a plane somewhere and start whacking away. Uh, spiritual warfare is a little bit different than that, and uh, just because you feel like you don't have uh, all the weapons and all the tech uh, doesn't mean that uh, that you're going to lose. You know, uh, we're we're encouraged to uh, to endure all the way to the end, um, and uh, and that's something that we can do. Uh, you know, just just as we are, and just to go back to uh, to Butker. You know, if we uh, if we focus on uh, getting closer to God and the, the spiritual athleticism that's entailed in that, uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to be in pretty good stead. I think uh, you're right. Uh, I hope you're right. Uh, James, I, I really enjoyed this. I got to get to work. <laughs> yeah, man. I thought this was work, but that's all right. No, we, we, got, we all got we to hustle these days. Uh, it's, it's been very real. Jason Whitlock, thanks so much for joining us today. James, thank you so much. I enjoyed the conversation. Likewise. All right, folks, that's all the time we got, at least until next time around. So if you're watching on YouTube, give us a like, give us a subscribe, comment below. Who would you like me to interview? I want to know. Until next time around, this is Zero Hour. I am James Polis, and may God have mercy on us all.